There are few pieces of media that charmed me as quickly as Berserk did. Things like Tokyo Ghoul and One Piece had poignant first chapters. Death Note or One Punch Man serve as perfect pilot episodes. And yet nothing I've seen so far compares to the utter shock of brilliance that is delivered in just four pages of Berserk. Page 1. A hulking muscle man is sleeping with a beautiful woman, only for her to reveal herself as some sort of demonic figure. Page 2 and 3. A widespread of the demonic figure wrapping herself around our behemoth man. He grits his teeth. Fear. Zeal. We're not sure until page 4. Mr. October of the firefighter calendar pulls out the fucking crossbow, shoves it in the demon's mouth, and says, I'm not locked in here with you. <laughs> You're locked in here with me! After just four pages, you're left with this bewilderment of, what the fuck did I just read? Is this dude just always ready to fight demons at the drop of a hat, or did he sleep with this woman knowing she was secretly a demon and simply bided his time to float the one-liner and spray lead? Both are absolutely crazy in their own way, and furthermore, is that a steel arm? And on the fifth page, our titular black swordsman dons his long flowing cape and walks off into the night, leaving only the desecrated body of a skullfuck demon behind him. It's at this point that if my grandma is watching, I am going to politely request that you turn off the video and never click on a berserk analysis again. Probably should have opened up with that, to be honest. Well, now that she's gone, my name is Hoodie Song, this is Kato, and today I want to talk about how berserk became so iconic in just one volume. This video is brought to you by our new webcomic, Dr. Song's Very Human Robot Zero. It's a daily gag strip following the totally real lives of the two people who run this channel. Dr. Song is a down-on-his-luck scientist determined to prove his genius to the world. To do so, he's invented a revolutionary AI named Zero. With his groundbreaking robot, the two are set to undergo their riskiest experiment yet, becoming YouTubers. Can Dr. Song and Zero trick the world into believing the robot is a real human being? Or will they be exposed as nothing more than failures to the scientific community? A new issue of the comic drops every day at 5pm EST until the end of March. Follow us on Twitter or Webtoon Canvas to check it out. Links will be in the description. With the whales of a pulverized monster in our wake, we travel to a nearby kingdom, where we meet a character that would become synonymous with the Berserk franchise, despite never having appeared in most adaptations. Puck the Elf has been skipped over in every single anime except the 2016 one, and those versions are all the worst for it. Puck is an excellent addition to the story, not only as a great character, but also an insanely valuable narrative tool. For those not familiar, Puck is a tiny fairy-like creature who we meet tied up and being mockingly harassed by some brutes in a local pub. As a character, he provides a perfect blend of comedic relief to the grotesque violence coming from Guts. I look at these three panels from page 13, and I can't help but chuckle at this spunky little sprite gnawing at threads between his teeth and arrogantly berating the men throwing knives at his body. And when he flails about and cries at the brute's threat of shoving those words back down his throat, I am immediately in love with this character. The range of emotions coming from Puck make him both hilarious and intensely lovable, which is perfect for for the eventual sidekick of a brooding mercenary of stoicism like Guts. Contrast that with the very next page where the brute gets a crossbow bolt pierced through the side of his head, and I think that's the prime encapsulation of Berserk's strengths. On one hand, you have this visually breathtaking manga with striking dedication to the blood and gore of battle, readily slaughtering its characters in the most brutal of ways, and right below it you have a panel of a chibi puck in a cute, shocked expression pulling the ferocity of the scene back into the lighthearted, if only for a brief moment. It's hard to overstate the necessity of comic relief in an otherwise dark story. Anyone can their manga with a brooding protagonist that slays monsters, hates other people, and just stares silently at the distant moon in the sky. But it takes skill to be able to do that while successfully maintaining bits of levity. If the purpose of a story is to entertain, then the purpose of someone like Puck is to relieve us from the endless dread and depressing moments. They give the story emotional range, keeping readers from lulling in one prolonged state of intensity, because if the story always wants readers intense, how long until they get bored? Giving us emotional highs and lows keeps us invested into the narrative for a longer period of time. For that reason, Puck is the perfect side character to this manga, and I absolutely love how that's accentuated within the first couple pages of his introduction. But beyond introducing Puck, this scene serves as an important moment for the audience in understanding Guts within the world of archetypical lone wolf stories. As Guts is fighting the thugs of this bar, we get a crucial description for his weapon of choice. Quote, It was much too big to be called a sword. Massive, thick, heavy, and far too rough. Indeed, it was like a heap of raw iron. It's hard to pinpoint exactly what about this I love so much. Of course, it's not the first character with a big sword. 
you could maybe say Guts, as we know him in this first few pages, is fairly archetypical and maybe just a really solid, cool design. But also, maybe it's the fact that it doesn't hesitate to acknowledge this aspect of the character. I think there is such beautiful merit to embracing the cheesiness or camp of your story. At a glance, a certain audience may look at Berserk and think, look at this meathead swinging around a huge sword, how boring. It wouldn't be too unfair to those unfamiliar to think Berserk is this run-of-the-mill dark fantasy for young boys to project their wish fulfillment on. And yet, from my estimates, Berserk is liked by all types of demographics. And I think maybe that's because of things like this. The fact that it calls attention to how crazy this weapon is. Yeah, it's massive. It's probably impractical. It may not even fit the technical qualifications of being a sword. And by the story directly noting on that, it displays self-awareness. It earns a bit more consideration, as if saying, I know what this looks like, but stick with me here. And we do, and because of that, it's almost easy for me to slip into that young boy mentality. I shed my layers of calloused cynicism that have been earned over years and years of bad storytelling and instead find myself getting hype and excited for a big man swinging a cool sword around. I look at the shot of Guts standing with the sword slung over his shoulder and I just think, man, that is epic. Earlier, I had alluded to the fact that Puck isn't just a great character, but a valuable narrative tool. That becomes apparent on page 47 when Puck reveals his elf ability to sense the emotions of other people. Through this ability, it becomes clear that Berserk is a multi-layered story with more emotional depth than just a cool guy with a sword. In a past video on Hunter x Hunter, I remarked on how useful it can be to a narrative to have someone who could read the emotions of other characters. In the case of Hunter x Hunter, it was the character of Melody in the York New City arc. Melody's role in that story was to witness the mental and emotional state of Karapika and interpret that to the audience in a way that could help us fully understand his character. With this ability of Pucks, we get a similar situation here, though I would argue even more relevant. On page 52, Puck physically shudders at Guts' declaration that anyone who dies because they get caught in someone else's fight doesn't have the strength to survive in the first place. Immediately, this becomes a topic of interest to the audience. By having Puck's emotional radar react to this, the story implies depth to this statement. This means something immensely profound, maybe even upsetting to the main character. It's not just a random principle that Guts has. There's more to it than that. It's an impeccable case of foreshadowing. What is Guts alluding to here? What event caused him to start thinking? this way. As he further proclaims that someone who can't live the way they please might as well die, Puck tries to interpret Guts' emotions. It's not just rage, there's sadness, fear, something even deeper. On a surface level, this tells us there is more to Guts than meets the eye. There is a story here, a tragic history of people being weak and dying because of it. Himself, others, we're not sure yet, but it's there. On a more macro level, this is what I would consider Berserk's first turning point. The manga has already proved itself worthy of further investment. It has beautiful art, a badass main character, emotional range in its supporting cast, and an intriguing enough plotline laid out. But it's in this brief exchange that Berserk hints at just how deep it can go. Berserk is not the cultural phenomenon it is because of some great art and epic action sequences. There are plenty of manga that can offer just that. But Berserk has captured an incredibly diverse audience and stands out amongst the crowd of stories like it because of things like this. In one small close-up, we allude so deeply to the mystery behind Guts as a character. Who is this man? What is the complexity behind his sunken eyes? On page 105, we meet an old man and his daughter offering Guts a cart ride. Seeing these two get slaughtered came as a genuine surprise to me. Perhaps not the simple fact that they did die, I guess that's fairly easy to see coming, but really just the intense brutalness with which it happens. The fact that this poor girl gets pierced through the chest within one chapter was crazy enough, but when her undead corpse steps out of the cart carrying the decapitated head of her own father, that was fucked up. But what's narratively important about this sequence is that it's not just a torture porn scene. It's not just Kentaro Miura deciding this would be fucking edgy and cool to throw us a curveball. It leads to this really interesting moment where, I think for the first time, Guts hesitates. Remember those first four pages. Guts is the type of man who was able to slaughter a demon while in the midst of sleeping with them. He is not a man we know to get caught off guard. And yet here is this young girl, someone who showed him kindness, and he finds himself at the tip of her blade. Even Puck reacted faster than he did. It's a shocking moment that both creates intrigue and adds a little bit of insight into who Guts is as a character. And yet by the flip of the next page, he has swung his sword and cleaved her body in two. Whatever weakness this girl was able to pull from Guts, it's clear that it's a weakness he has long suppressed. Perhaps not as successfully as he would like, but it's something from a distant past, one that he is able to hide by brandishing his sword. 
On page 159, I think we truly start to learn the type of man Guts is. When Puck tries to comfort him by assuring the girl's death wasn't his fault, Guts bursts out laughing. Of course it wasn't his fault, the girl was weak. She lacked the strength to reserve her right to live. He can't concern himself with the plight of ants. At least, that's what he'd like to believe. There is no confirmation at this moment, but even a naive soul could see the lie behind Guts' twisted smile. This is not a man of conviction. It's a man desperately trying to rationalize the tragedy surrounding him at every waking moment. I don't believe that Guts believes what he's saying right now, but he has to lie to himself. He has to convince himself that this girl and her father dying is what was meant to be, because otherwise, he has to face something truly terrifying. As Puck looks around at the field of demonic corpses left in Guts' wake, he is like us all. This is the world Guts lives in. And with that, a look of solemn empathy. The beauty of Berserk is in its intense emotional complexity. Fans of this series know that it only gets more nuanced and challenging as time goes on. The Golden Age arc immediately following this is by many considered the best arc in all of manga, and it's hard not to feel similarly, but I think there is immense value to the character work done in this first volume. As someone whose first experience with Berserk was skipping the Black Swordsman arc, I think I could say with certainty that the story is worse without it. I love the Golden Age, but the Black Swordsman arc does so much for understanding the emotional context for this series. On top of that, it creates unparalleled levels of intrigue for who Guts is as a character. The brief glimpses of insight that Puck gives on Guts set the stages for a series of character arcs that would shake the world of modern manga. It's hard to overstate how amazing this story is, but this idea that the genius of Berserk only starts with the Golden Age arc is misguided at best. For my money, Berserk becomes a classic piece of storytelling in just its first volume. Thank you for watching. Before I go, I just want to give a quick shout out to all the incredible patrons over at patreon.com slash k2yt. We're super active in our patron discord server, occasionally throwing some late night anime and movie watch parties, so if that's something you're interested in, pledge just a single dollar to get an invite. I'm also preparing to launch a new basketball webcomic called The King's Way over on Webtoon Canvas, so you could follow my personal twitter at hoodie underscore rights for more updates on that. Links to everything will be in the description. Again, my name is Hoodie Song, this is Kato, and thank you for watching.